Anki is an amazing tool, but just like any tool, it can be misused. If you misuse Anki, you will waste time and retain less information. Those are two pretty bad things. In this video, I'm going to show you some kind of extra tips compared to my previous videos on how to get the most out of Anki. Let's get to it. So the first tip is to get organized. If we go to my Anki deck over here, you will see that I have every single thing under one deck. So when I wanna start studying, all I do is I just click this deck and start studying, bam. And it may seem like a small thing, but when you start to accumulate decks like I have here, and then if you look at this decks, which is what you have in the very beginning, if you start trying to study through every one of these individual decks, you're gonna waste time. The other good thing about studying under one deck is that it mixes everything together randomly. If you agree with Hebbian theory, which I won't talk about it, but it says basically that if you learn something mixed all together, you're gonna remember it for longer as opposed to just studying one track mind. But Another more simple way to think about it is, is whatever you're learning about gonna be like one topic, like the brain or the heart? No, it's probably gonna be all of those things mixed together. So when you study, right, you wanna study everything mixed together. So that's exactly what you do when you put everything under one deck. A quick little thing to make sure you are doing this mixed learning is you wanna go to kind of this, for me it's not a cogwheel, but you wanna go to the cogwheel on the side of your thing, go to options, and make sure that your order of new cards is show new cards in random order. And then your reviews, you don't have to touch. Just when you go into the deck, they will mix them up automatically. So I'm just editing this video. I forgot to say one thing that the sub decks that are under your individual deck, your on king deck, will be only done randomly if you have the Anki scheduler v2.1 enabled. So I'm gonna show you guys how to make sure that's enabled. So all you wanna do is go to Anki on the top left, hit preferences, go to scheduling, and then you'll see Anki 2.1 scheduler beta. So you just wanna make sure that that is checked off. All the reviews underneath one heading deck will be randomized if you have this selected. So again, all your reviews underneath the heading deck will be randomized if you have Anki 2.1 scheduler enabled. So the next thing that's really accelerated my studying and helped me study a ton more is the Pomodoro method. No, you won't be studying with a tomato, but you will be studying on time-based intervals. So what I have on my computer is this little nice thing on the top here, and then I have it to study, and then I'll go for 25 minutes, and then it'll give me a five minute break time. So I think this was, yeah, this was the Be Focus Timer, Focus Timer app. Um, and you can set this in whichever way you want. You can do 50 minutes, 10 minutes, 25 minutes, five minutes. But I found the best way for me is the way it was originally done by some Italian guy. And he said to do 25 minutes of studying, five minute break. 25 minutes of studying, five minute break. 25 minutes of studying, five minute break. 25 minutes of studying, no, don't worry, your video isn't stuck on repeat. Then you do a 30 minute break. So three sets of 25, five, and then the last set is 25 and 30. And the reason this is great is because we tend to just lose focus if we stare at a screen for so long. And also when you just set out such a crazy amount of time to study, you often tell yourself, oh, I need a break. I need to take a break or something. But if you actually have the timer set in here, it kind of forces you to study in this time and then take a break in this time. Another thing is when it's your break time, don't just go onto a YouTube video unless you're watching a Zach Kylie video. Go on to get up and like walk around or do something else. The next tip is when you are finding new cards to study in your Anki deck, don't use cards that are under specific decks. Instead, use cards that are tagged in a certain way. Because as you can see with my deck, if I wanted to go through and learn it based on deck, I mean, I would go, literally, I would go insane. Because this is just a complete and utter mess. I wouldn't use this way. Instead, I would go to the browse section. And then if you are using the on king, and if you have watched my previous video, you know, everything is tagged very nicely. And a question I had on another video is no, these are not individual decks. As you can see these little icons here, these little icons mean tags, as opposed to kind of these, this like looks like stacks of paper, which are your individual decks. So one little bonus tip for those of you that are using the on king deck is that if you want and you can't find tags to certain things, but you want to start going through cards, you can start unsuspending cards based off the date created. Now, why do you do this? Well, the guy that originally made the decks, the donkey decks, created the cards in kind of a logical order. So for example, on endocrinology, all this kind of stuff makes sense. And then as you go farther down, you might get into the physiology. And then as you go 
even farther down, you might get into the pathology. So again, if, if you want to just kind of study cards in a deck, you can go to the decks on the left-hand side here and just sort by date created. When you sort by date created, you'll be able to go through in the order that the original Zanki created these decks. Tip number four is edit your cards. It's really easy to fall into the trap of memorizing instead of understanding with Anki. And when you actually edit these cards, you start to build connections in your brain. So if we look at a specific card where this editing may actually come in, a tip is when you edit it with the Anking, if you're editing for the Anking deck, is you wanna put the notes under your lecture notes and not your extra section. Because what happens when the Anking updates the decks, which I think V8, is coming out soon. When he actually updates these decks, usually there might be some new extra information or some other things that are being thrown in by people. And what happens if, if you write information in this extra section and then you update the deck and you don't go through some special kind of tricky steps, then that extra information that you wrote in, wrote in will get overwritten. So what I like to do personally is I like to write this extra information in lecture notes. This way, this information will never be overwritten and it will be saved no matter what updates you do across the On King decks. So if we look at an individual card, uh, for example, this one is lichen sclerosis, is characterized by thinning of the epidermis and sclerosis fibrosis of the dermis. So I also know it presents this leukoplakia presents in two other places, vulvar carcinoma and uh, lichen simplex chronicus. So if I know those two things that are connected to this one card, I wouldn't know that kind of just by this front card. So what I might do is that presents, might type in under lecture notes, presents similarly to lichen simplex chronicus and vulvar carcinoma with leukoplakia. And what I'll do now when I study this card is I'll be able to hit the lecture notes and see that piece of information pop up for me, which is a great way to kind of link this information in my head because when you're a doctor, when you're taking this big test, maybe you see leukoplakia and you're gonna need to work backwards. So if you see leukoplakia, you'll be like, okay, now I know it's either vulvar carcinoma, lichen simplex chronicus, or lichen, um, what was the other one? See, it. this is where the memory comes in, lichen sclerosis. Another reason to add these personal tidbits to every single card is that if we believe the idea that memories are neural connections and the stronger a memory is, the more neural connections there are, then shouldn't you want to make as many connections in this topic to another topic? I think yes. This is if you, of course, believe the theory that neural connections are the reason that we have memories and things like that. The fifth tip, and I would say the most important tip, is do the cards every day. This is the way the Anki algorithm is built. If you're not doing the cards every day, you're messing with Anki and Anki's like, I don't like you anymore. And you won't like your retention either. Okay, we're, we're gonna cut that. We're gonna cut that. What you need to do to get the most out of Anki is study every day for long-term retention. You gotta do that. A kind of controversial or maybe not controversial opinion I have is that many people say that you should do your Anki cards on your downtime at the grocery store or when you're at the gym. God, no. I think Anki is the most important thing I do every day in regards to retaining like medical school information. So I make sure it's the first thing I do every day. I wake up in the morning and smash my cards. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna talk about, it gets a little bit complicated, but I'll try and walk you guys through it, is aim for an 80 to 90% success rate on reviews. So what does that mean? Okay, let's go to Anki. Let's go to my Anki. So when you are reviewing older or mature cards, which are cards that are greater than 21 days until their next review, you should be marking good on 80 to 90% of them. Now, if you are marking good on these cards or these review cards more than 90%, then the cards are too easy. If you're marking it less than 80%, the cards are too hard. There's a good amount of research to back this up and a couple other Anki professionals talk about this kind of Goldilocks zone of being between 80 and 90% in this kind of success rate. And the idea behind this is that your brain likes a challenge. It doesn't want things that are too easy and it doesn't want things that are too hard. Okay, we're gonna go to stats. The only thing I want you to worry about is kind of these retention rates. So this is what I had for the past day, this is what I had for the past week, and this is what I had for the past month. 
and I'm doing pretty good. You wanna be hitting between 80 and 90% in this retention rate. And if you don't have this picture showing up, you need to download the True Retention app. This number was, for example, 97.9%. Well, that would mean my cards are way too easy. So what I would do is I would go back to settings of my main deck, go to options, and the thing I would touch is this interval modifier right here. And what the interval modifier is, is it adjusts the time in between cards for every single card you click. So it'll adjust the interview interval time for a hard click, a good click, or an easy click. So if, for example, the card would normally be one day distance when you hit good, if this interval modifier was 200%, it would be two days and so on and so forth. So if my cards were showing up too frequently, and this percentage was too high, above 90%, I would go to these settings, go to my interval modifier, and change it up. I might change it to, I don't know, 110% or 115% and see what that's like for a week, and then go back to my stats and see if I'm getting closer to that 85% number that I wanna be at. Because when you up this number, again, you're gonna increase the distance between cards, which should make the cards harder. Now, for example, if I was at my stats section and this said 77.9%, or let's say something crazy like 65% or something like that, then I would wanna make the time in between cards shorter because that means I'm answering way too many cards wrong and it's too hard and my cumulative reviews are gonna go way too big. So what I would do then is I would again go to my settings here on the right, go to options, go to reviews and lower this. So I might lower it to 80% or 75%, and that would make the distance between my cards decrease. So now I would be studying if, for example, I had a card that was two days. If I change this to 50%, then I would get that card in a day instead of two days. But as of now, the Anki algorithm is working pretty well for me, so I just leave it at 100%. Tip number seven is learn keyboard shortcuts. So this is one I use all the time and this isn't necessarily an Anki keyboard shortcut. Let's say let's go back to the same card, lichen sclerosis. If that still wasn't enough information for me and I needed a little bit more, what I could do is go to Amboss here, search my lichen sclerosis, and the keybind here we're gonna do is command shift four. And what that does is it makes you able to drag and drop an area of the screen to screenshot. So I might drag and drop over this nice Amboss section, swipe to my Anki Amboss place, and place that right in the lecture notes. That way, when I go over the card, I can see this extra bit of information. I think that's probably my most used keybind for Anki, even though it's not really a keybind. Other keybinds that I use are if I'm studying and I want to edit a card, I can do E, that's edit. Another thing keybind, which I think everyone knows, is that if you hit the space bar, it goes to the next card, and if you hit the space bar again, it selects good. Another keybind, which I use all the time, are the numbers one, two, three, four. So if you hit one, it's again. If you hit two, it's hard. If you hit three, it's good. And if you hit four, it's easy. Sometimes also, I'll just be smashing the space bar so fast. Sometimes I do it without even looking like this, because it's just me and Nan are just connected at this point. Um, but sometimes I'll just smash it and realize, oh, it wasn't a good card. Another key mine use is Command Z. I'm sure people know that, but that goes back to the pass card. And then if you want to browse, it's just B. And then in the browse, there's really only two key bindings that I use. Um, if I'm learning a new deck or a new card, I would just do Command A and then Command J to suspend and unsuspend cards. So Command A selects all the cards and then Command-J would suspend a card. You can see that yellow highlight, which means it's suspended. Okay, let's talk about creating cards. So the first tip I have for creating cards is create fewer cards. The On King, and there are amazing other resources out there that are edited over and over and over again by literally teams of people. Now, who do you think is gonna make better cards? you or the people that have teams of people working for them to make the cards. Now I know there is the argument that making your own cards helps you to remember that information longer, but really if you do that, you will just get lost in the sauce. You can't keep up making your own cards forever. I'm a second year medical student now and I know my friends from last year that were making their own cards are now pretty much all using a pre-made deck. But if you really need, if you have the need to make your own cards, I'll give you a few tips for making better cards. And I do make my own cards occasionally, and I make my own cards when I want to study an incorrect question. So if you go to my deck here, you'll see there's a bunch of this junk, but the only place I add my own cards are RX 
this is just a cue bank. So this is where I add cards that are my own personal cards that I've done wrong. And the only real way I add these cards is that you make sure you go to the top left here and make sure you go to close on King Master. That is the best kind of deck that way you'll have all these nice little things to make the card and make sure you're under the right deck, otherwise you will lose your deck of cards. Some rules to make cards is that I would use closed deletions. So if you're trying to learn two plus two equals four, you want to basically use closed deletions. So how that works, you type in the question and then you'll highlight it and then hit this little parentheses here. And then you, what I like to do is I like to also highlight the answer and hit the parentheses here. That way you create, as you can see, there's a C1 and that means one card. And then if you see two, two cards, that way there'll be a card that says two plus blank equals four. And then there'll be another card that says two plus two equals blank. So as a rule of thumb, keep your cards short and use closed deletions. Another thing is when you're making your own cards, try and link to external resources. Again, the On King already has this covered amazingly because there are first aid and other things under that. But if you're learning something that you don't see enough third party resources for, Google it. Command Shift 4 and just place it in the lecture section or the extra content. This way you get a bigger picture of what's going on because I'm kind of starting to see it now that if you just focus on the individual details from every section and you don't make it make sense in your mind, you will forget that information. And the last tip I have for everyone is just to make it pretty. Make it pretty. Look how pretty this is. Look how nice it is. And the thing, important thing that I also do is when you actually study the deck, I don't like to have my background under the study deck section because I find it distracting under the individual cards. But when I first go into studying for the day, I like to see this nice background. So in order to do this, you need to download the customized background add-on and I will link to a video from the On King on how to actually set up and install this. But I found that video a little bit complicated, kind of like a couple other of his videos, which is why I make these videos in the first place. Um, so if you guys want to see maybe a video that's a more basic tutorial on how to actually make your background nice and pretty and change these colors, get this thing down here looking really nice, just let me know and I'll make that in a separate video. But yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for watching and I will see you on the next one.